Hi everybody, welcome back. We're on experiment 16 and we are using um, the 555 timer that is located right here. Really small chip, about the size of uh, about the size of a pinky nail. And he's one of the most famous chips there are. And we are actually, you know what, before I get into the details of this circuit, here's what the book looks like. If you wanted to see the, uh, the pin assignments. So as you can see, pin 1 is the negative, pin 2 is the trigger, pin 3 is the output, and pin 4 is reset, 5 is control, 6 is threshold, 7 is discharge, 8 is positive. And because this is the first experiment I have used with this, uh, this IC, um, we're not going to probably use all of these pins in this experiment because some of them are a little bit more advanced, particularly pin 5, which would be the bottom right corner, uh, the control pin. So given the complexity of this circuit, um, I mean, much much simpler than circuit, many circuits out there, but still much more complex than some of the ones that I've done in the past. In fact, pretty much all of them. Um, I'm not going to go into super depth on this circuit. I'm going to go into some of the more basic uh, things that I've noted as I've played around with it. I've probably been poking at it for you know a good hour or so, just um, throwing my, my uh, uh, leads from my, my multimeter in there and trying to kind of observe behavior. And um, one of the other things to notice is this these little uh, uh, tactile switches. Very small little guys, but nice feel. Very nice click to them. Um, they kind of look like just a, a box with four pins coming out the corners, and I actually had put them in uh, sideways, thinking that uh, they fit better in the proto board that way, and it actually caused about a half an hour of grief because I couldn't figure out why the uh, circuit wasn't working. It was because the uh, current wasn't flowing through these guys in the proper way that they uh, uh, expect the current to flow. So, anyways. With that being said, if you guys ever work with these switches, make sure you put them in the correct way. And based on what I saw, there are little, little notches that you can see. You probably can't see in the video, but they're very small, but they do kind of help signify straight up and straight down. So we've got a 5K potentiometer right here. Um, obviously, this is not the kind that usually comfortably sits in a proto board, but that's okay. And a couple caps. I think this one was like a 100 microfarad, and this was a smaller guy, like a 47 or a 0.47 or something like that. And let me see this guy. Yeah, he was a 47. And then there's a really small little ceramic one right next to him. Um, otherwise, just a handful of resistors, LED, and the 555. So component-wise, not too complicated. Um, but there's a lot going on, and that's because we have eight pins with um, different behavior. So, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start by demoing what it does. And from there, we will uh, explain, or we will explore, rather, I will explain. <laughs> so, let me get this up to uh, 9 volts, because that's what we want to power this with. Okay, we're at 9 volts. And what we need to do now is pretty much start turning knobs and pushing switches. Actually, you know what? Let me put this guy right over here instead. So, if I push this, the light comes on and it turns off on its own. And it actually turns off in pretty much exactly 5.2 seconds. And there's a reason for that. It's configured to out, this IC, the 555 timer, is configured to output a pulse uh, for exactly that amount of time. And it's configured to do so based on this cap and that resistor. And if I were to push this switch, I could interrupt that 5.2 seconds by pushing this switch. So I could either let it go that full duration, or I can push it 
and immediately disrupt it. And what's really cool here is, is the reactivity between the light and the switch is immediate and clean. Um, the reason this guy is allowed to interrupt this is because he is essentially wired to that pin 4, which is our reset. And when we don't, while we haven't pushed the switch, what's going on is like before we push this, if you follow the trail, we're, we're coming from power or from positive power through this uh, long red wire here straight to the pin. So we have, you know, uh, basically a fully positive supply to that reset. But the moment we push our switch, we have introduced negative uh, power into this equation. So in a sense what we're doing is, to, to say it a different way, rather than all the you know positive charge flowing that way, it also flows actually back to ground this way because it's a faster path. So we end up seeing a uh, positive drop on pin 4. And that's pretty much how that pin works. Um, when you drop uh, or introduce negative, uh, negative power to that pin, it stops output on the pin 3. So pin 3, since we were just talking about that, is the primary output pin for this, this chip. And the output is running through the LED. And you, can't, you might not be able to completely tell, but this resistor's end here is plugged into the same row as the LED uh, negative lead. So literally, 3 is flowing through the LED and then through this resistor to ground. So power source is the chip through the LED, through the resistor, to ground. That's a circuit right there. That's its own isolated piece. Pretty easy to see what's going on. Um, what else? So the two pins that are the hardest at least so far for me to understand, and I've gotten I've gotten my head around it a little bit now, are the, uh, let me grab a pin again here. Okay, um, pin two, which they call the uh, trigger pin, and pin six, which is the second from bottom one on this side, right there, that is uh, our threshold pin. So both of these guys, um, they kind of have a symbiotic relationship for controlling the, um, uh, you know, the on and off state of the output uh, pin three. So if we have a, a nine volt power supply, which we we do, here let me just uh, throw the uh, throw the negative portion of our uh, multimeter into the common ground over there. Um, so if we were to observe this without, you know, when we're not actually, you know, pushing any, um, any buttons or switches or anything like that, um, here, we'll just put our, uh, we'll put the probe end on the reset pin for a sec. So we're running, uh, pretty much right at nine, nine volts, because we know that when we're not doing anything, we want nine volts hitting the, uh, hitting the reset pin. And we know that we have ground uh, negative feeding into um, pin one, which as you see, it's pretty much got no voltage uh, registration there. And likewise, if we were to hit um, pin uh, eight, you'd see we've got nine volts. So those get the uh, simple ones out of the way. <laughs> so pin two, which we said was the uh, trigger pin. How this works is if we have one third of that voltage or less uh, uh, amount of pressure hitting that pin, pin two, then that will actually trigger output. But let's say, so if we have like five, uh, you know, volts of, you know, positive force hitting that pin, that is too high to trigger a output. 
and that's what this potentiometer is in the circuit for. It doesn't actually serve too much other than to, other than to teach that principle. So we know, for example, right now, that if I push this switch, that light comes on. So what that means, given the rule I just said, is that if we have a 9 volt supply, which we already confirmed we do, right there, right, then we want to see less than 3 volts outputted from pin 2. So right now, we've got 9. But if I push this switch, we should see less than 3 volts if the light's going to light up. And we see 2.7. That was me actually holding the tactile switch down with my finger while taking the measurement. So if I increase the resistance here, which is really introducing negative charge, um, then really what we're here, why don't we just do it and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> so we want to, I'm gonna turn this guy so that we, actually let me make sure I'm getting this the right direction here. Let's see, light's still on, so I think we actually turned it the wrong way. See, 0.3 volts. So I definitely turned that the wrong way. One sec here. See, the light doesn't work this time. And that's because we must be above three volts. Watch. So we have six volts hitting that guy. So, as you see, um, so, so just to kind of, I guess, spell out how this potentiometer is playing into this, pretend this, this component isn't here right now. We have a wire right here running from positive through a resistor to pin two. Now because in, in, uh, in this current configuration, uh, pin two essentially acts like an infinite resistance um, right now. So really, you're gonna have nine volts of uh, charge right here, see? So normally you might expect a little bit of voltage drop to occur, you know, if you got nine volts here, a little bit drops here, and the rest drops here. But since this guy is pretty much infinite, it all just drops here. Now, the moment you open up another path for this pressure to, to go, instead of all hitting against that pin, pin two, it also takes this purple line, and goes through our switch, through the potentiometer, through whatever amount of resistance is being presented by the wiper inside the potentiometer, and then out to ground. Uh, this is introducing uh, another path, right? So therefore, all of a sudden, we're gonna have a voltage drop at the resistor, and then another voltage drop at the potentiometer. So if we were to take so right now we've got like nine volts, but if we go like this, push the switch, we're dropping three volts there. And that means we're gonna be dropping another, uh, where is it, six volts um, here. Because we know that we have, we have six volts of pressure hitting the, uh, the center post of our potentiometer. And then when we get out the other side, we've dropped it all. So that's how we ended up dropping that nine volts once we created a path. And likewise, let's move uh, to the other side of this IC for a second. We said that the uh, pin six was the threshold pin and that one was also interesting because, actually he's probably the most interesting. So pin six here, he has a rule, kind of like we had before on the uh, pin two, about you know when we when we dip below a third or less of the uh, uh, supplied voltage, um, we start being able to actually trigger uh, output. So on pin six, when we approach two thirds of the supplied voltage in charge, because remember we have a you can as you can see here we have a capacitor that's actually 
um, charging against uh, that row. And when we actually reach, in this case about 6 volts, that will actually trigger internally here it's going to kind of flip a, a, a flip-flop if you will as the book states even though this is truly solid state but it's, it's conceptually the same as a flip-flop um, when that happens it basically resets the IC and uh, no more output occurs so that means if, if we arm ourselves with that knowledge right now we take a little reading we've got pretty much no voltage no, no charge on the capacitor right now now, if I were to push this button, pretty much nothing happened. And I believe that's because we need to actually make sure that we uh, are actually going to trigger the output in the first place. We had a little too much resistance over there. So I think I turned the potentiometer the wrong way. One sec. Put it about there. All right, so watch. See how it's charging? And boom. It reached six volts, and then it just discharged the entire thing. So next time we watch that, let's watch the light and when that happens at the exact same time. It's charging, it's charging, it's charging. Light's still on, off. That went off the exact time this capacitor discharged, which flipped that internal conceptual flip-flop. So there's a direct relationship between uh, the capacitor and resistor here in terms of like speed that this thing's this thing's charging um, versus you know the other side of this where we're making sure that we actually meet the uh, the minimum or rather we don't exceed the maximum third uh, of the total voltage threshold on that trigger pin. So hopefully this has given a relatively light introduction to how the 555 functions. I'm still very new to this myself. In fact, this is the first day I've even played with one. But I definitely uh, feel that there is a lot of potential for some really cool circuits with it. And I'm looking forward to trying to build some of those. Um, some of the examples the book gave uh, included things like, hey, you might have a, uh, you know, like a security light in your front yard where a motion sensor gets, gets set off and you have a, you know, maybe a timer involved that says, keep that light on on my driveway or something for, you know, I don't know, 60 seconds and then turn it off. Uh, or maybe you've got a toaster in your kitchen, like most people, and you push down the latch or whatever to, to start your toast, but maybe while you're in the middle of the cycle, you turn the, the little knob to say, I want my you know toast to be toasted more, which really I think is kind of like a potentiometer there. That really just um, adjusts the duration that the uh, uh, output of your 555 would be you know, high. This does not go to mean that uh, every toaster has a 555. Uh, a little bit of an oversimplified example, I think, from the book, but it gets the point across. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with them. So anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this. I believe this is all there is to Experiment 16. If there are any more parts that I feel are worthwhile uh, exploring before we move on to 17, I will make a part two. But otherwise, see you guys uh, at Experiment 17.